so what we're going to talk about today is um, like the world of smart contract VMs, um, smart contract platforms, how t development on top of programmable blockchains um, sort of goes mainstream. Um, we have three excellent guests who have some of who have been doing groundbreaking work in this uh, uh, section. So maybe just a quick introduction, who you are, uh, what you've been doing in this space, um, and maybe like 30 seconds about like what is the development environment that you guys are trying to bring to market. Okay, um, my name is Mark Miller. I've been uh, working on smart contracts since 1988. Uh, I'm chief scientist of Agoric. Uh, and uh, having done a lot of uh, research exploration uh, on languages and virtual machines for doing smart contracts well, I joined the ECMAScript committee, the committee that standardizes the JavaScript language in 2007, and I've gotten the enablers into JavaScript for using it as a good, secure, smart contracting language, which is what the Agoric platform is doing. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Jam from Novos. Uh, I joined blockchain space in 2012, around that time, and I was in Theorem research team working on Casper sharding, and I I also built permission blockchain before, and uh, what we are building now is a permissionless blockchain that is um, has a similar architecture to Bitcoin, and what 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 we have on this new blockchain is what we call CKB VM. Uh, it's a low-level virtual machine, and yeah, we want to bring something new here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Daryl Hawk, CEO of Certic. Um, we are focused on certified software, so our founders are both professors, the Yale Computer Science Department chair, as well as a professor at Columbia University. Um, they focus on making formally verified software, so the compilation throughout the entire stack is uh, exactly what it's supposed to do, um, and doesn't do anything more than that. So we are focusing on making virtual machines, things that really uh, could bootstrap volume, so things that work together with existing virtual machines. Um, and our team received grants from the Ethereum Foundation as well as from IBM to connect with EVM, Hyperledger, and et cetera. So I guess, um, so, you know, uh, uh, of our panelists, two of you have chosen to sort of uh, either push uh, sort of your existing ideas uh, into the into the world of blockchains and smart contracts or a new virtual machine into uh, uh, the world of blockchains and smart contracts. And I think uh, uh, our friends at CERDIC are sort of um, trying to see how far you can go with things that are related to like uh, the EVM. The EVM, you know, I think has sort of, we could talk a little bit about its flaws um, but it also has been, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars potentially of, of work have gone into developer tooling, uh, infrastructure, educating a community of people around how it works. So I'm just curious to the panelists, why do you think it's important to either create an alternative to the EVM and or like why would you defend sort of uh, working, continuing to work on the EVM, especially in the world where the Ethereum Foundation has mostly abandoned the EVM uh, in their current roadmap? So there's two aspects of the EVM. Uh, there's the one that most people are drawn to trying to fix, and there's the actual uh, deep problem. Uh, what most people are drawn to trying to fix is having a better virtual machine for doing computation and for being a target of compilation for languages. So for example, the Ethereum Foundation themselves is already moving from uh, EVM to eWASM. Uh, where WASM WebAssembly is a decent uh, virtual machine design for running computation and for being the target of compilation. Uh, it's very much a, uh, von, a von Neumann address space style virtual machine. Um, uh, so that's the easy problem, is, is just having a better platform for computation. The hard problem, the essential problem, the deep problem that everybody should ask first when looking at any computational smart contracting platform is what is the semantics of the enforcement mechanism that stands between smart contracts that are mutually suspicious of each other? 
the semantics of the enforcement mechanism is the semantics of the security primitives that all of your inter-contract interaction uh, depends on and therefore the security of that interaction. And eWASM preserves the fundamental flaw of the EVM, which is anyone can send a message to any contract, and therefore when the contract receives the message, it has to do some kind of access check to decide how to regard the message it's received, and the Ethereum method to do the access check is what's known as message.sender. It's an identity-based access check on the identity of the immediately sending process. This brings us to identity-based access control, and there's a whole long literature of the weaknesses and flaws of identity-based access control, the confused deputy problems, the inability to reason uh, compositionally about correctness, uh, et cetera. Um, so, uh, there's nothing about WASM as a virtual machine that biases you towards identity-based access control. It was just that uh, that was a part of Ethereum that was not called into question when moving, moving from uh, EVM to eWASM. Yeah, uh, I totally agree with that. Um, and fortunately, what we are trying to build is a general verification platform, not a computation platform. So yeah, I think it's more about, it. actually it's not only about virtual machine, it's about the runtime model, the execution model of smart contract, what you're talking about, the, the message change between, message, message exchange between smart contracts. I think that's a, yeah, that's a problem to security. So uh, I, I want to, um, uh, when we uh, decide to, decided to, create a new virtual machine rather than EVM. We, we think from some other angle. Um, for example, um, we think the blockchain space is a very small community right now. And most developers there, they are using um, daily language like JavaScript, uh, C++ Java. And um, it's actually not that difficult to create a new virtual machine if you can adopt some existing standards, right? That's why we chose RISC-V, which is a open standard created by Berkeley and is widely adopted, implemented, tested in the industry. Uh, and it's the, the daily, com the, the compilers we use every day already support RISC-V instruction set like GCC, LLVM. So, what we, what we want to attract is those developers there, not just developers in this, already in this like EVM community or Solidity community, but all those C developers, C++ developers, Rust developers, Go developers out there, system developers, yeah. Yeah, I would say uh, it's, I was just thinking about it. It's funny because the question is like uh, there are different implementations of the same thing, but we all do agree on some of the problems that exist. Our method of doing this is really to look at blockchain and how difficult it is to get a developer community. So in different chains, different protocols, they're still trying to bootstrap it. Ethereum has a big community itself. So our method for the virtual machine, for the CVM, the Certic virtual machine, is to superset the EVM as well as extend it to more things. So there are problems still in terms of smart contract to smart contracts interacting. If the price point is high enough, then one smart contract could cheat another one and just, and you wouldn't know because it's a machine interacting with another machine, how do you know that it's a safe uh, counterparty? So in our virtual machine, we're gonna have proofs on chain. So before interacting with something, you could actually say, give me proof of certification of the formal verification of specs, whatever it is, machine checkable proofs, and then interact. So it's not uncommon in real life. You don't, if it's a website that's a little bit sketchy, you might not want to send much money or buy many things. If it is something that's BBB certified or uh, all of these different accolades, then you may be more secure. So we want to do that on chain. Um, and it's going to be similar to, I guess, layers of uh, autonomous vehicles where we have level one to level five. That's how autonomous you are. In terms of security, it could be level one to level five of how secure you are. So did you get formally verified or was it just audited in different means? But have the evidence on chain. 
our token will be used as an ecosystem to tax those that are less secure, so your fees will be higher. If you're certified, your fees will be lower. But ultimately, it's to solve the same problems where as blockchains get more complex, uh, the interactions will only grow. So today, we do have a lot of DeFi smart contracts interacting with smart contracts. We haven't yet seen a cheating smart contract that's very large in scope. Maybe it's waiting for the, the price points to be higher. We don't really know. But our approach to the problem is to superset the existing ecosystem so we could bootstrap that and make it so we're actually built on Tendermint and Cosmos. Um, today, you could run a Solidity code smart contract on Cosmos using our uh, testnet. Um, so it's, you don't need to do anything different. You just deploy it on that side. Um, it's all still in work, so it's a testnet phase. But the approach is to expand to more, um, but not to have people pick and choose, but really to work with as many as possible. So if Move VM seems to take off, then it's pretty self-explanatory how to, to incorporate that as well, because it's not that much different from the EVM as a resource allocation. But our intention for the VM is to limit logic within the VM layer and be more enterprise ready, like you're mentioning. Um, so do less smart contract logic in it and have the smart contract logic be done in the smart contract itself. The VM should be pretty lightweight, so it's airtight and you know um, it's a one-to-one -one translation of what is intended actually happens when it's converted to bytecode. So I guess the, the, you know, I'm gonna try and keep this like balance between like technical and product aspects of smart contract languages and uh, VMs and all of this stuff. And I think one of the biggest open questions that I think uh, Jan sort of hinted at is our big challenge is how do we get our community be that much larger? We like haven't even filled this room on this in this panel. Um, we aren't, uh, you know, the the existing smart contract developer community is quite small. So I'd, I'd like some comments from the panel. Says what are the missing pieces that need to be filled in? Um, in the smart contract landscape in order for there to be actual mainstream adoption of this mode of development for people to feel excited, comfortable, safe doing building this kind of software. Um, and what, so what are the missing pieces? And maybe a, a, and especially a thing that has been, I've been thinking a lot about recently is what are the components of a standard library for building smart contracts? Um, I think that seems to be like one of the missing pieces. Okay. So this issue of wide-scale adoption is why having explored the programming language issues of supporting good, intuitive, reliable uh, expression of smart contracts uh, in my own uh, research language named E that I uh, was working on in the 90s through the early 2000s, uh, why in, two th in 2007, uh, I joined the ECMAS group committee and did the much harder social and standards work um, of getting the enablers that I knew from the earlier e-work that were needed, getting those enablers into JavaScript is because a brand new language that was specialized for smart contracting was always going to reach only a tiny audience, would have tremendous barriers to adoption. If I can get the enablers into JavaScript, suddenly there's 20 million JavaScript programmers that are our potential audience. Uh, more than that, the security model that we're using is the object capability model. And the object capability model, as opposed to the identity-based access control model, is first of all, a technically much superior model. It does support compositional reasoning about correctness. It does support very well the principle of least authority for partitioning risk. Um, but more than that, with regard to adoption, it is intuitive for object-oriented programmers to learn because the intuitions that they already have of how to use object-oriented encapsulation for the sake of modularity and abstraction, for the sake of information hiding, object capabilities start off as treating security as the extreme of modularity, that you start off uh, building security abstractions with an extension, a natural extension of the intuitions that object programmers already have about how to build abstractions. Um, so uh, that's the first element of how we're trying to re reach a mainstream audience. Another one is that our platform 
is chain independent and distributed and works across chain, across chains. Uh, in the, the initially we're building on the Cosmos platform, we're building as a Cosmos zone. We're also collaborating with Cosmos on IBC as the inter-blockchain protocol that enables contracts on one chain to send messages to contracts on another chain. Uh, that means that the mainstream, looking at the potential of adoption, realizes with this platform, there is no lock-in. I can write smart contracts for this platform, and if tomorrow somebody invents a brand new, better consensus protocol, and we want to move over to that chain, all of their investments in building contracts for our platform are, is, is a portable investment. So we believe we're hitting all of the high points in getting mainstream adoption. Yeah, uh, as I mentioned, uh, I think we should like, uh, embrace more, uh, more embrace the existing open standards instead of like trying to invent some new virtual machine in blockchain space because I think, uh, yeah, um, so um, we we actually did a lot of um, experiments on our own virtual machine. Like we um, we tried to uh, compile a Ruby interpreter. If you know Ruby, right? I I, I tried to compile the interpreter to RIST file instructions and run the in interpreter in our virtual machine, so our developers can use Ruby to write the smart contract. We we did the same thing for. JavaScript. We did the same thing for TypeScript. We we uh, we try to compile WebAssembly code codes to risk five instructions and run TypeScript on a virtual machine, and we got success. So I think it's a uh, it's actually a fast way to to the larger uh, developer community. It's a shorter path to the larger developer community, and. Um, yeah, and and another uh, thing I think we should also spend a lot of time on is tooling. I think a lot of strength from Ethereum is is tooling, the, like the the, the truffle, the all kinds of frameworks built on top of Ethereum. Um, those things, it's those things help um, develop developers to develop smart contracts more easily. And in some sense, I think Solidity is also a, is also a tool built on top of EVM because without Solidity, you can only hand write like EVM by code, right? So I think tooling is very important. Yeah. So do you think it's going to be a challenge having to bootstrap an entire tooling ecosystem on top of uh, as, what is it CKVM? Yeah, I think it's a challenge. I think. Um, but I think there are a lot of opportunities here because we we consider um, we observe a very interesting um, um, s uh, how do I say it? a very interesting uh, scene in this uh, blockchain community is almost all developers in in Ethereum community comes from the comes from with, come with application background. It's what we call application developers, um, but there are so few system developers in this space. There's no offense to application developers because I was one of them, right? But if if the blockchain is slow and expensive as some like computer in 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 sixties, if you if you uh, remember what how develop how developers look like. In, at, at that time, all those are system developers. We we, we need more system developers in, in developers in this space to be more careful about the resource use, about secure, about security. I think they, this this system developer community is overlooked in at this time. So yeah, so our strategy uh, at Novos, we are trying to attract those system developers to attract them to build like compilers and cryptography libraries on top of our, our virtual machine. So it's kind of different from like build applications directly on our virtual machine. I think it's, yeah, we, we will see. I, we will, we, we, uh, we just started 
yet. So I don't know how it will develop, but um, yeah, we will see. I, I, that was a great way of pitching it, like trying to attract system developers. I thought that was a cool. Go. Yeah, I would say uh, in terms of adoption, um, two things come to mind of the problem. So one is the number of developers, uh, and another is when they are developers, which camp are they a part of? Uh, so the number of developers, I think that is kind of uh, a chicken or egg in some ways. To really bootstrap a bunch of developers, uh, enterprises that want to develop on this will force all of their employees to be developing in that sense. Um, they may be waiting for different things, so maybe waiting for security, which is a hypothesis, scalability is another hypothesis, maybe it's all of these different things, use cases or just uh, proof of concepts, maybe they're happening today. And then when there are developers now, which camp? Um, the camp problem, I think the way we see it is, stay in your camp that you decide because as a developer. Maybe describe, define the term camp. Camp as in like, uh, do you choose to do uh, one language, like let's say, EVM versus something else, inter non-interoperable groups. Um, so like having them focus on just this. And you're seeing a lot of combative approaches on the protocol levels. So like I am pro whatever protocol, uh, that means that these other protocols are not good. Um, and so having that I don't think is conducive to growth of the space. You know, having the ability to work across them more interoperably, um, I think that will help bootstrap when you do have a number of developers that they could continue to code in their preferences, yet still contribute to the broader ecosystem. Uh, and so that's why our approach is kind of very similar. Uh, the compiler approach is the way we do it, where we have our own uh, functional language called DeepC. Uh, it, that's heavily developed. It was initially developed at Yale. It's now getting uh, developed at Columbia as well with our team. Um, the DeepC language is, we actually looked into the move language, and it's very similar decisions in terms of architectural design. Uh, not resource allocation per se in that way, but um, in not having for loops, for instance, or, or things that we think that just shouldn't have been there. Um, and what we do is we compile a different language that exists into DeepC. So we've done a compiler for JavaScript, for Solidity, um, and that allows us to run the option of doing Solidity on our chain or DeepC on our chain. Um, and that's optionality that we just want to continue to create these compilers. So there's more and more skills um, of, for developers that choose a camp, or by camp this is a language. Um, or just going directly to what we want to create as a very user-friendly, intuitive uh, language design. I'd like to um, uh, address part of Zaki's question that I that I missed on uh, the first pass, um, which I'm is just going to go back through it. So go ahead. Okay, <laughs> uh, which is the framework issue. Yeah. In the early web, people would program directly to the DOM API. Uh, in Early Node.js, Node.js was kind of a bare bones platform where you had to, to roll your own complex server software. Uh, these days, uh, JavaScript programmers are used to programming in rich frameworks, uh, which have a lot of prefab components in them and have good systems for composing components. Uh, we see the same issue arising with supporting good smart contract development. It's very much part of the Agoric vision. Um, uh, we are building towards a rich framework of both good prefabricated, reliable, heavily vetted contract components. Um, you know, covered calls, various other options, different kinds of uh, auction institutions. Uh, all sitting on top of Zoe, which Dean explained in the previous talk, that gives you a good partitioning of risk uh, so that you have, you can make strong statements about what's not at risk, even though some of your software has flaws in it. Uh, the fact that object capabilities uh, support compositional reasoning about correctness, we're raising that up through ERTP and Zoe to compositional, uh, to being able to enable people to take these components and compose them with confidence. That's, that's a central semantic issue of why these object-oriented frameworks are so successful is because the compositional framework gives you a semantics such that the components can be assembled together into composites with confidence. We're trying to bring the same thing to smart contracts. Um, uh, uh, most contracts will be compositions of reliable components combined with parameterization, uh, as, and 
uh, uh, but we also support the creation of reliable new smart contracts within the framework. Uh, so we really see this as very much an extension of what JavaScript application developers already experience of rich frameworks for other domains. Smart contracting needs such a rich framework. So do you guys, on the, the CKVM side and the CERTIC side, uh, where do you think those sorts of frameworks are gonna come from? I, I, I think it's implicit, like on the CKVM side, is perhaps it's gonna come from the systems developers, perhaps? Yeah. Is that, is that, that's the bet, that you, you provide a VM, it attracts the systems developers, the system developers built the frameworks, and that is what attracts the application developers? Yeah, I think um, what, we, what we provide is not just a VM. We, we provided a VM which uh, adopts a open standards, so you can use your existing experience on our blockchain, right? I, I think that's a, uh, a good thing for those system developers, and um, we also make our virtual machine very abstract to allow system developers to do all kinds of stuff. For example, uh, one of the design goal of CKB VM is to allow developers to deploy cryptographic libraries on top of CKB and run those crypto prim primitives in this virtual machine, rather than make a crypto primitive, primitive a pre-compiled thing in this virtual machine. Which means if you, if you are a develop, uh, layer two developer, and you want to ad adopt you some new crypto primitive, such as Genoa Signature or BLS or Blake 2B in your protocol, you can do that on CKB. You, 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 you can do that on, in, in CKB VM. You just need to find some system developer, ask them to help you to, de to develop this new crypto primitive and deploy it on blockchain, and then you can use it. You don't need to wait like the, the blockchain to hard fork to add a new crypto primitive or precompile into the virtual machine. I think, yeah. Well, okay, I just wanna like kind of zoom in on the question a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, in existing software development, we don't view an auction or a market maker or any sort of economic component as a pre-existing, as like, it's not a thing you pull, you don't download a market maker from NPM when you're building a website. Um, but that perhaps is the story for how we do it in smart contracts. And to the extent that I'm aware of existing code design patterns, et cetera, there really only exists basically the Cosmos SDK, uh, the uh, EVM ecosystem and the Agoric ecosystem that has those pieces. Um, so I think like what this is like, I guess what I'd, what I'd like to really get at is, is, this, is that the, the wedge that gets you to mainstream adoption or not? I'm gonna take a shot at it first on the CKVM side or on the CERTIC side. Yeah, um, so I actually, I, I do think you need like the training wheels or especially for something that's new, you need people to just figure out this is a template, this is how I do it, these are the, the best practices. Otherwise you run into a lot of people doing new things for the first time that could be detrimental and hurt, make the entire space move backward. Especially when you have things that are high risk like, like let's say an enterprise where it exists today, it works, they go into this, if they get hurt, if something bad happens, even on a proof of concept, then the propensity to actually want to go forward even more, probably less likely. Um, but I, I think uh, based off of what you're saying, Jan, um, the architectural decisions of how to keep the, the VM as lightweight as possible, um, that's, that's similar to what our mindset is, because we don't want the VM to be meant for, to be meant for uh, smart contracts, but more of to be meant to run compiled code or just code securely. Now, all the logic of the smart contract, which maybe it's something else that's not a smart contract running right on the VM as well, we're doing it in a way that's very much enterprise ready. So it'll be on uh, x86, ARM in the future. Um, we actually, for the purposes of testing security wise, we have our own, uh, the Certic OS, it's uh, the world's only uh, concurrent, fully verified and certified hypervisor as well as OS kernel. So that's on the bottom layer. So it's right above the metal. Um, and then it could run the VM within that in a sandbox. So a smart contract that is not proven does not have to interact with the main chain. 
It actually is in a sandbox and could show its breakage in that way. Um, and then if it does pass it, then it, it goes into main chain. So it doesn't mess up anything else. It doesn't have the ability to break what's existing. Um, but in those ways, using security as a mindset, um, we think that it allows people to continue doing what they want to do and something that's confined and safe and then only interacting with the broader ecosystem, preventing, I guess, adversity to using this new technology by having it safe uh, step by step. Okay, um, I actually don't get the question, frankly. Yeah, yeah. So, the, so I guess the question <laughs> is, where do the economic components of a smart contract come from? And like, do they come from the project? Do they come from your developer community? How do we make sense of, of, because we're not. What do you mean by economic component? Um, I think Uniswap is a great example of like, kind of like a universal primitive. Um, uh, it's an automated market maker that lives on chain. It seems to encompass like a sort of universal design pattern. Where do those components come from? And uh, you know, how do developers process, compose, use those? Um, and how do you guys think, how do you think about that? Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so it's, it, yeah, it's the, it's the economic component, not the technical one. So I think it's important for the, for the system you design to show some properties, some, some uh, advantages over existing system to still to attract developers, to persuade them that what you build on this platform has some economic um, advantage over on that platform. So what we are uh, trying to do is not like, um, I think this is more about the whole picture, the, the program model, not just about virtual machine. Because virtual machine, yeah. Um, what we did in Novos CKB is we changed the pr program model to be UTXO based. It's not a account based smart contract model. So we can see some benefits for um, economic components in this system. For example, the, the deterministic property of a transaction is different from what in Ethereum. Um, um, like, if you think about, because it's a UTXO model-based smart contract platform, if you think about Bitcoin, right, the, the result, the effect of this transaction is determined, to completely determined before you broadcast the transaction to the network. It's different from Ethereum, where you, um, you actually uh, send a computation request to the network and the network will do the computation for you and you get the result. A very, a very easy to observe um, effect is on Bitcoin, all those transactions are valid. Invalid transactions will be rejected by node and they will not be included in blockchain. But on Ethereum, they are out of gas failure transactions. That Those are failing transactions, right? I, I think that's, uh, that's one of the reasons we chose to build a UTXO based smart contract model because we think such deterministic is important in some um, DeFi scenarios. We need that kind of determinism, yeah. Mark? So raising the level of abstraction, I think is a key issue, uh, which is, you know, we have the virtual machine level of abstraction, we have the object level of abstraction, uh, we have the distributed objects, uh, but then uh, at Agoric, we built ERTP, the Electronic Rights Transfer Protocol, uh, as a pattern of objects for manipulating tradable electronic rights, and we did it in a general manner so it can deal with fungible and non-fungible rights to transfer exclusively or, or non-exclusively, a uh, whole dimension of variations of kinds of rights, but we make the notion of rights-based coordination a first-class concept at this higher level of abstraction that's distinct from the object level of abstraction. We build our frameworks in terms of that higher level of abstraction. And then uh, Zoe is the first step towards the next higher level of abstraction, which is first-class support 
for safe exchange, offer safe exchange and for contracts, then building the financial institutions in a composable manner on top of Zoe uh, so that um, things like Uniswap, as you mentioned, various auction components, various kinds of derivatives, other kinds of market makers, and where these things come from, Agoric themselves is going to do work to seed our ecosystem with some initial ones, both because of their utility, but even more as examples of what it means to create a component for our system. And now I'm going to shamelessly plug the uh, Cosmos Hackathon uh, that starts tonight and lasts through the weekend that Agoric will be participating in uh, to invite people to contribute new contract components. So part of the answer of where these come from is hopefully some of them will come from the work that you all do tonight at the hackathon. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, great, great panel. Uh, good questions, thanks. Good answers, awesome. Bye. Great, thanks. Thank you.